right. Of the seven that are up here, are there any that you strongly agree with? So agree. I agree with the administration. I really think it's kind of unbelievable. Okay. And I don't think it's the way. So this is the one that you wrote about then down yeah, the bottom. I wrote about this one. Um, I said that if I agree with, I agree with the fact that like people like are extremely just slapped off socially, and I feel like we are presented with people in their lives that we should be living, and it makes people feel like that they're not good enough for themselves and just method in general. And the whole talking to me about it too is because the things that are being presented on the media are like fake. Like people, some people aren't living that lavish life that they're presenting on social media because that, it just makes everything so toxic. So you think that there is a, and we're going to say things like always and never, and we don't mean yeah. that it's going to be 100%, but that, that there's like a false standard that's being set for establishment? Yeah, I agree with that most definitely. So just Tyler, anything you agree with? Yeah. Now, this one, like, and, and it doesn't just say reading increases wisdom and improves our ability to relate to one another, but it says specifically like reading books increases. So, um, and, and this isn't specifically what it has to be for you. What would be different about reading something in book form as opposed to reading on a physical copy? And the book is available for you on your iPad or you could read, but also kind of listen along to it on audio book like YouTube. What is it, if anything, about reading a book that is going to make it more permanent? Okay, so it's more authentic for you as opposed to someone else determining what that voice is going to be. Anyone here that you disagree with? Strongly. Number one, some books, music, movies, and other media should be censored, so should not be censored. Okay, why not? Are you thinking, and not that it's meant to be in a certain realm, are you thinking of this inside school setting, outside school setting, just public in general? No. So if, if, a, if a school were to go, we don't want this to be read, that would be different than something being removed from like the government or something like that? No. Since you mentioned about the social media being silent, and you said in whatever method not going to be heard, Aiden, what did you end up putting for number six? Is Napoleon still being talked about? Yes. If he's not being talked about, you're probably done at that point. So, like, the French Revolution would be an example where you had a, a large group of people that you had, certainly had a revolt that was going against type of government, monarchy at that point. Now, French Revolution, those who were leading the revolt also ended up kind of having their own revolt against them. Uh, reign of terror doesn't go so well when, when you start, you know, having guillotines all over the place. But that would certainly be an example, and probably one of the more famous historical examples where, yeah, those who are being disagreed with the government are, are certainly exploring that idea. And that's certainly an idea context that's going to be popping up within what we're going to look at here with, uh, with Fahrenheit 451. If you didn't get your line paper out, now you want to get the line paper out. We're about to get in there. I know, but Thank you.
Oh yeah, we're stuck. What's Fahrenheit? Temperature. So you have Fahrenheit, you have Celsius. Um, Fahrenheit 451 is name of book. Uh, the number is certainly significant with what's going on within the book. Anyone have any idea what happened? That 451 is used to the name of the book. As we're talking there with paperwork. So in fourth grade or fifth grade, if you had the assignment where you had to make an old document or whatever and you put it in the oven, you could burn the edges a little bit and it, and it would be okay at 400 degrees. Once you get it up to 452, not that it's magically going to blow up at that point, but that's the point in which the paper does start to burn. Um, like, uh, like the pedestrian, Fahrenheit 451 is taking place in the future, um, and it's meant to be, we'll get into this, it's meant to be a dystopian society, so it's a bleak look at the future. One of the things that Tyler talked about was that reading books, you know, you gain a little bit more wisdom or you gain a little bit more information from. In the society which is going to be presented here, the 21st century books do not exist. Um, or those that do still exist would be illegal. So it would be heretical, it would be anti-government to be in possession of a book. It doesn't have to be a book that would be saying bad things about government, but if you're in possession of any kind of book, it would be illegal at that point. It's not something that you would be allowed to. And we'll get into why we're taking a look at Fahrenheit and all that kind of stuff here as, as we get into it. So, quick little, you know, synopsis. And not that you're writing this word for word, but, but I would put down the dates here that we're taking a look at. Novels written by Ray Bradbury. And again, Ray Bradbury is the person that we talked about before when it comes to the pedestrian. I'll zoom in on this a little bit. Um, he is noted as a science fiction writer, so a lot of his stuff tends to have more of that... Um, future uh, aspect to it. Technology tends to play a big role in a lot of the stuff that he's looking at. This begins as a short story in 1951. It's not the pedestrian that it starts as, as a short story. That's a totally separate text that he's writing. But in 1951, he has a story it's called The Fireman, um, about a fireman in the future. And then this ends up turning into the larger work, which is Fahrenheit 451, evolves into this novel in 1953. Have you read The Fireman? some regular guy. Here you have a fireman guy. Um, there's not many firemen, but in the future, the job of a fireman is not to put out fires. The job of a fireman is to start fires. So as opposed to having water coming out of the fire hoses, it would be fire that is coming out of the hoses and starting fires. Specifically, we're taking a look for this stuff. So homes at that point are meant to be fireproof. You don't have that need to put stuff out, but you have a need to, uh, to get rid of some things and that, in this case, is going to be books, which we'll take a look at. So the story gets published in the 1950s, which is going to be pretty significant um, when it comes to, you know, overall era that's going on. Mentioned French Revolution, and not that you have the same thing happening, but you certainly do have some, some fears that would be going on in the 1950s on both the U.S. scale and a global scale as well. So it's written during a time when you have that threat of nuclear war. This is post-World War II. So you've already had, you know, um, bombs in Japan going off, but now you have an armed race that's taking place between the U.S. and between Russia. If it were 1952, instead of us doing our fire drill, what would we be doing? We would do our air raid drill where we would hide underneath our tables, keep things in protection from anything, and we would sit here and wait for the air raid to go by. For a lot of you in your homes, because a lot of the homes in the North Village, which were built in the 1940s, 1950s, you very well might have a bomb shelter in, in, your, uh, in your basement. Uh, if you have a closed, if you have a, not closed off, but if you have a secluded area that like mom or grandma or aunt used to like canning, storage where it's really oh. fixed in there, yeah. that's probably your bomb shelter. Um, a 
a lot of homes, like I know over by like uh, Goldsmith and whatnot, a lot of those homes will have double layer basements to them, so that you could be in your basement, but then you could even get into a further sub basement. And that idea was, should any kind of air raid take place, that you would be, you know, better protected. How much? How long? Oh, I mean, you're getting into a whole bunch of scenarios as to, you know, what are the, what 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 are the the, the, the rations and things that you have. Um, probably the the most famous bomb shelter would be the White House, uh, where where they have, you know, their their situation room. I forget what the number is, but the idea is that they'd be able to survive for multiple months. But you're talking in that case for. Do you think that we could keep you, you or you or I are not going to be going into that bomb shelter underneath no, the White House not. anytime soon. I was watching this video on YouTube and it was talking about like the uh, like the world's like greatest like shelter and it was like it and you got like all of this is on the ground. Like it's on like CNN. I was watching it mm -hmm. and it was like it's over like two billion dollars worth of like this. Well and if you go to some places like uh I, I don't remember how far beneath it is, Los Angeles has it started off as an earthquake shelter. Where it seems kind of weird, but it was kind of like getting below what the destruct. But then it turned into bomb shelter, especially with 1950s, because you know concerned that the West Coast would be, um, you know, at the brunt of, of things that would be going on. I think pseudo unrelated, but also in the spirit of the bomb shelter of people thinking. Um, I remember reading. If any of you saw the movie Us, that came out, mm -mm. Uh, the opening card stated that. Uh, the fact that there was over I think, 1,100 deactivated subway tunnels underneath the United States that okay. uh, we don't know the purpose for, but have the thickness of a bomb shelter. Well, you go into places like Europe, too. I mean, you know, Paris or, or, or London, they didn't necessarily destroy buildings, they just kept building up. So you have like under cities that, that are existing in, in a lot of places within the world. And Katie, one of the things too, when, when this stuff was going on, the idea was it would survive the immediate impact. Yeah. No one in 1945, 46 was aware, I think, of really what the ramifications would be long term when it comes to things yeah. like radiation and, and, and stuff like that. Um, you'll have some bombings that have taken place that have been comparable, you know, war-wise to what happened in Hiroshima or Nagasaki, but they don't have the residual radiation deaths and things like that that, that have continued to plague there. All right, so still here within that whole context, World War II has ended only a few years before, because again, this is 1953, World War II is coming to a close in 1945, 1946, but you still have that threat of nuclear warfare looming. Um, a big part of the book is going to be taking a look at censorship, but a big part of the book is also going to be taking a look at this idea of nuclear threat of, of being kind of unsure, but also being uninformed of what's going on. You're also in this era of McCarthyism, which we'll kind of get into here in a little bit. Anyone familiar with the term McCarthyism as it pertains to U.S. history? 1950s, you have a senator from Wisconsin, Joseph McCarthy, um, where you have fears of communism taking place in the 1950s, and a large part of that is because the Soviet Union and nuclear arms race into a kind of like an us versus them mentality, much like you would have had with the French Revolution, if Robespierre was to go, hey, you're sympathizing with the crown, you should be executed. You have a similar thing happening in the 1950s where McCarthy would be going, mm -hmm. That looks a little too great for me. You must be a communist, and then you could face some persecution. Doesn't mean execution would be happening, but you certainly did have a lot of rumination of, uh, of public figures. And if you were going to be labeled as something, it certainly could have some ramifications as to what that kind of person was going to be. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, the Red Scare. And, and you have a Red Scare in the 1920s, kind of like in that post-World War II, and then post-World or post -World War I, and yeah, post-World War II is where you have Red Scare, Red Menace, McCarthyism, all those things kind of get used. So because you have a time where people are in some ways fearful, and you're dealing with a new form of technology, this is when sci-fi sci books and movies really kind of take off, because you have this war to end all wars, this idea of bombs that could really do some serious destruction, all, all, all those things. 
to kind of make pretty good material for, for a sci-fi writer or movie producer, which is what Bradbury is certainly going to be taking a look at here. Since you'd be a little sleepy today, keep you awake. Seemed like a good title for what we were going to do. All right, um, effects here of, of World War II. This is going to kind of lead into what we're taking a look at here with uh, with that context of 1951, 1953, and whatnot. So World War II has come to a close. Hitler has just been defeated. But one of the things that he did during his reign was you had the burning of many books. And this is something that also continues into Soviet Union as well as Communist China during the 1950s, um, where the idea is by burning of the books, you end up kind of, you know, ruining some of the ways that the power can be or ideas can be spread to multiple people. Um, any guesses as to like the most common book that would be burned? Yeah. Well, in, for in, in, in for um, for Hitler, it wouldn't only just be you know Jewish Bible, which is going to be the first four books of old. Any any anything that's really going to be religious in nature, and this is also going to hold true when you get into Soviet Union and the Communist China, because if it is a communist nation, there is not any national religion. The idea is you don't want any national religion because then that's taking attention away from the government. 
and Hitler was certainly doing a similar thing. Um, so yeah, whether whether it was Jewish or any other kind of religion, culture, if it was something that was going to be taken a look at, there's another authority beyond the government and who's in control, that was certainly something that was going to be looked to be eliminated. And any kind of essays over the years where people would be looking at what does it mean to have control and power and, and what is freedom and things of that nature would certainly also be, be taken away. So this is the idea that Bradbury is going to focus on where it's not just any book that is being burned, but the idea that if you're going to take away something that's going to cause people to be informed, that is what we don't want. Because it's easier to control a group of people that aren't going to be thinking for themselves than it is to control a group of people that would have a lot of idea, ideas that they are going to be wondering about. McCarthyism. So kind of mentioned this year with the 1950s and told you that we have uh, Senator Joseph McCarthy, and this would be a picture of him. Really from about 1952 to 1956, uh, he has a lot of power within the U.S. government. So what he is doing is basically he would be accusing anyone of who he thinks may have any kind of questions about the overall integrity of the government. His ultimate fear is that you would have communist spies that are monitoring the government. So if, he, if there's anything that he about what a person is doing, and really he's going to start with writers and celebrities and movies because Hollywood had really taken off at this time. If he thinks that there's anything that is being done in some kind of movie or show or book that is going to be spreading anti American ideas, he's then going to call you out for that. Joseph McCarthy, Senator from Wisconsin. What he would do is he could either accuse you of being communist or you of being anti-American. And there's a difference between the two, because if I'm going to go, you know, Zach's a communist, and here's my proof, you know, I might come up with something that's going to have some kind of tie to socialism or, or whatnot. And honestly, in the 1930s, 1940s, just about everyone had some kind of tie to socialism. But if I, if I go to accuse someone that you are un-American, that's pretty hard to hard to go, you know, Bill has more school spirit than Tyler does. That's not something that you can really quantify in a way. So he's making accusations that you can't really necessarily prove nor disprove. But if it's coming from a senator, if it's coming from a representative of the U.S. government, you're going, glad you're on America, that was enough weight for a lot of people to go, yep, he is, and therefore he's going to be dealing with some persecution. Now again, there, they were being silenced okay, we think this person may be a communist, he must be executed. But certainly, if you were, like, say, a director in Hollywood, and they think that your shows, your movies, and whatnot may be American, well, you're going to have a hard time finding work um, later on you know, in your career. And that could end up being very damaging for you. So he made basically a practice of making accusations that would deal with, you know, whether it could be something as severe as treason and being a spy, um, or it could just be accusations of disloyalty where, you know, there's basically no type of evidence that you can really use. And a lot of times he would say, I have evidence for all these reasons as to why Nick is a communist, but those things would certainly never be made public to anyone. But it was just, here's these papers, you know, I'm not going to necessarily let you see them. Um, he had a pretty strong run until about 1956, at which point people start in a lot of media um, kind of doing a lot of backlash and, and end up explaining why what he's doing isn't really going to be American in its own right, and that's when his power kind of begins to start to disappear a little bit. All right, so... One of the things that Bradbury says he's trying to do with the book is he's trying to prevent the future, which is an interesting way of kind of wording things that I want to try to prevent what's going to happen where you don't necessarily know what is going to happen um, with it. Here's some things that he does kind of foresee, and we talked about this with the pedestrian, because you remember in pedestrian, a lot of people stay in their homes just watching TV all the time and, and whatnot. Things that he certainly did foresee so far as future developments would be probably dependency upon iPhones. Um, earbuds are a big thing that Bradbury talks about. They're not called earbuds yet because that term's not around. But basically, iPods would be an idea that, that he's certainly looking at because a lot of the characters will have, he calls, they call them seashells. They're basically, you know, wireless headphones that are always going to be in your ear at all times. Certainly 
doesn't know about how you know phones can be taken off the internet, but the idea that you can have something else kind of talking in your ear the whole time is an idea that he looks at. So in part one, um, Guy's wife is wearing seashells all the time. Basically, it would be earbuds. Um, big screen interactive TVs, those are things that he's certainly expecting to see. Um, it's not uncommon for people in their house to have basically a wall of screen. So it's not a 15 inch TV or a 60 inch TV, but it is that wall of the TV. Uh, his wife has three TVs in the one room. So this wall's a TV, this wall's a TV, this wall's a TV. The hope is that fourth wall can become a TV. At which point you go, how do you get out of the room? You go right to the lab. Mm -hmm. Or And then you can then you can go out through the uh, through the floor, but the idea of being surrounded by that media by that TV is something that he's certainly you know looking at. Um, rise in violence, growing illiteracy. Remember, illiteracy is going to be the inability to read or write. And here kind of becomes this big one, and, and not that social media is responsible for, it, but you certainly see it with social media. Condensation of information into just little sound bites. So rather than getting a full picture. You get more of a 15 second clip, a 30 second clip, maybe a 20 minute news clip turns into only one minute, so you're only seeing little bits and pieces of information. And so if that ends up happening, you don't necessarily have the full story of everything that's going to be going on. That's where we're going to take a pause for today. We'll come back, do a little bit more background with this for tomorrow. So you have your books, part one we're reading for Monday.